So uh, hi again, I'm uh, Srimoy. Uh, I'm a former academic economist. Uh, worked for years on university campuses and two years ago caught the crypto bug. I wanted to do game theory and auctions using smart contracts. And somehow ended up at IOV Labs. Now you'll see two symbols here. One is RSK and the other is IOV. RSK is the blockchain. It's built on top of Bitcoin. And IOV Labs is the organization that supports it. So you can kind of think of it like the Ethereum Foundation and Ethereum blockchain. It's the same relationship. Okay. So moving on, uh, this conference is back in person after two years. Everyone was working from their homes. So as you can see from images, none of them are Instagrammy. These are everyday images of colleagues they were sending in from wherever they were working from home that day in the last two years. Okay. So just everyday images of just people in about 30 countries at IOV now. That's pretty typical for most crypto uh, startups is they're spread all over the planet. And so that's the case with us as well. And I know it's kind of really a shameless plug for ourselves. It's like everyone here in crypto is hiring. Right? No secrets there. Everyone is hiring, so we are too. Uh, I, I, normally, you'd keep this at the end of the talk, but OK, I'm shameless. Moving on. We'll start with a little bit on engineering economics, because my background is in both engineering and in economics. And so it'll give an idea of why I'm interested in space. Right? So this is something all of you would have seen in Econ 101, this boring you know, definitions of what money is or what it's not. We're going to add one more to it. It kind of reminds me of what Keith just said about Apple and the iPhone, Steve Jobs. 1,000 songs on the initial iPhone, right? Now, I have no songs on this phone because you can just stream it. Right? What I do have is everyone's Bitcoin history here. 500 gigs, everyone from 2010, everything. Right? So that's kind of what I care about. So I'm going to add one more to this list of what money is, and it's from one of my favorite papers. Okay, the title of the paper is something I really love. Money is just memory. Okay, so maybe some of you have seen this before. So it's a paper from 1998, so 10 years before Satoshi's paper. So it's got nothing to do with digital currencies. It's really about microeconomic foundations of money. It's written by Narayana Kuchalakota, who's an economist at Rochester now, but he's been at several feds before, at the Minneapolis Fed and the University of Minnesota, Stanford, micro foundations of money. So he writes a very technical paper. The Jet is known to be a technical journal. But like the smartest economist, so he will translate what he means in English in the abstract of his paper. If you look in, this is the main takeaway. He says, think of memory as just a record of all past interactions between creators, consumers, producers, and that's in the real world, and that's going to be the case in the metaverse as well. Just a record of all past interactions. And he shows that anything that you can do with money in an economy, you can replicate that with just memory. Right? But he proves technically that the converse is not true. Whatever you can do with arbitrary memory, you cannot do with just money. And so this asymmetry shows that money is just a very primitive form of memory. Right? So we add that to our Econ 101 list, money is memory. What Satoshi did, I think, is he combined these ideas of money being memory, and what he created was a uh, sort of peer-to-peer -peer money from peer-to-peer -peer memory. Right? So that's the peer-to-peer -peer memory part. All of us chip in by downloading blocks and transmitting blocks, relaying blocks, confirming the validity of transactions. And Recently, this idea has been pushed even further. It's not just peer-to-peer -peer money and peer-to-peer -peer memory, but it's moved on to something called peer-to-peer -peer memory manipulation. And that's what computation really is, right? You read something from disk, you compute stuff, symbolic manipulation, and then write back to disk. And there's a name that should be very familiar to people on this campus. Tim Rogarden, CS people, game theory people will know this name. Um, I just Two of his recent tweets. Blockchains are computers, not databases. And the second thing, uh, I don't know why he's had to say that, but this meme of blockchain as a DB, he hopes it goes away. Uh, but the first one is important. Blockchains are computers, not databases. Mm, little bit relationship with the Web 2 system, mm, how things are moving, just to give you an idea of engineering economics and blockchains versus Web 2 apps. If you use apps like Twitter, Twitter's backend is on Amazon. So once Elon takes over, maybe that will not last. He doesn't really like Bezos that much. But for now, 
Twitter's backend is on Amazon. So for storage, all the tweets and images, what do they pay Amazon for? These obvious things. They pay for the size of the data stored, how long they store it for, how fast they push data in and out, and then latency. How fast uh, the backup to a physical disk is. Okay. And that's just storage, not computation. Pricing gets really complex in the real world, cloud computing. What about the blockchain? What do people pay for storage? Okay. Uh, so those who are Bitcoin fans will know there's only just one price in Bitcoin, sats per byte. That covers everything. The network costs, the computation costs, everything, just sats per byte. So you compete, to your, your transaction get added before earlier by just bidding a higher sats per byte. Things are a little bit different in EVM chains like RSK and Ethereum, in which users are mostly paying just to read or write data. How long you store it for, doesn't matter. Write once, store forever. Okay, that doesn't exist in the real world. You can't just store your images forever. Google is doing it for now, but forever? But that's a blockchain promise. The size of how much you're storing, the duration you store for, doesn't matter in the pricing. You just charge for reads and writes. Terrible economics, terrible engineering. And that's one of the reasons I can run Bitcoin at home, but I can't run Ethereum anymore. I can run RSK, but that's because it's a small network. Essentially, all of crypto is nowadays running on AWS and Azure. You can't run a Solana node at home. And so that's leading us to the first uh, example of what we're doing at RSK to make things a little bit better, provide incentives and pricing for storage on the blockchain. Okay? So what we're going to do is add a little bit of price sensitivity <laughs> by saying, if you are a user, you are reading and writing to the blockchain. We're going to ask you to pay for a little bit of the space and a little bit of duration. And so it's called storage rent. Right? So every tiny piece of state data that your transaction touches, which for Bitcoin, the state is very simply un unspent transaction outputs. In Ethereum, uh, the state is a little bit richer. It's stuff like someone's balance or the size of a smart contract code. There are storage cells and parameters. So the idea is, if you touch some part of the state, you read or write to it, then just pay some rent for it. But only if enough rent has accumulated for it. Don't charge people one sat. There's just unnecessary computation and accounting. And at the same time, put a cap on how much would one have to pay per transaction. So don't put all of the burden on one user. So that's an idea, I think, if we start incorporating these things into blockchains, it's going to provide the incentives to keep these things small so we can run them at home. Okay. I'm going to skip this one a little bit and quick time check. Because I know I'm the only one standing between you guys and lunch, so don't want to go over. Uh, quickly go over the RSK blockchain because I think not a whole lot of people are aware of what this RSK blockchain is, rootstock. It was started mostly by some folks in Argentina, Bitcoiners in Buenos Aires and Montevideo. And what they wanted to do was they had three high-level goals. First was your blockchain should not compete with Bitcoin as coin, as currency. So the primary currency in RSK is Bitcoin. It's kind of bridged from Bitcoin, but it is, there is no other coin. The second goal was uh, no proof of stake. We are hardcore proof of work believers. So this is reliance on mining. Bitcoin miners, that's where our bets are. And the last bit is functional compatibility with Ethereum. So whatever is developed in RSK, those apps can be moved to Ethereum, or more likely, apps in Ethereum can be ported easily to RSK. That's for the developers. Now, if you're someone who's thinking about building a new blockchain, you will see that the easiest bit to do is the third one. Just take Ethereum's client, get, turbo get, ALETH, just take a big Ethereum JS and fork it. Right? So the EVM part is not a challenge. The challenge really is how do you get Bitcoin into your blockchain and how do you use mining? Because if you start a new blockchain with proof of work mining, you're going to be attacked day one until your token is destroyed or your coin is destroyed. Right? So the idea that we were using is uh, first build a bridge with Bitcoin so that the value of your coins on the RSK network is identical to the Bitcoin network. 
The blocks that are mined on RSK, all the transactions and block processing, is done through merge mining. So it's really just Bitcoin mining pools that do it. Right? Because if we hired our own miners, they'll destroy our network. So the, only, the securest thing is to just stay on Bitcoin. And the third thing is we forked a Java version of Ethereum uh, client. And that was, I think that's the easy bit. So we'll focus a bit on the first two. Okay. Mm, merged mining, uh, how many of you have no idea about merge mining? Or show of hands. Uh, so that's about half. I'm gonna assume that's half for folks back at home too. Uh, okay, so briefly how Bitcoin mining works is every miner who's competing to create a block um, creates a header file and then computes a hash of it. The hash is 256 bits long, so that's 256 zeros and ones. And the first uh, miner to get a certain hash that starts with, say, 80 zeros gets to mine the block. So that's like you are asking 256 people to flip coins, and you want the first 80 flips to be heads. It's kind of rare, right? But that's how Bitcoin mining works. Um, this is an example from two days ago. See the number of zeros up there? Uh, that's in hex, not binary. That's why the numbers are maybe 18 zeros and not 70 or 80, as if they would be. Uh, so, but yeah, so that is really more of a lottery. Some people say it's a, it's a math puzzle. It's not a puzzle. Just create a header file, hash it, and see if your hash, that random string of zeros and ones, has that many zeros out in front. So what RSK does is it takes advantage of how Bitcoin mining pool works. If you were to mine Bitcoin by yourself, you would never mine a block by yourself. It's just the odds are just miserable. So what people do is they pool resources. Okay? But if you're mining Bitcoin with your own rig, it's going to take you 10 years to get that many zeros. Okay? So how is a mining pool going to share the rewards? They say, let's pool together. Some of us are going to get five zeros to start with. Some will get 20. Right? So make the share of the pool contingent on how many uh, hashes you submitted that have at least five zeros to start with. Okay? So that idea is what we use in merge mining. You don't require people to have 20 zeros to start. You don't require five because that's too low. The RSK difficulty is chosen, the number of zeros that you must start, such that uh, it's 20 times more likely to find an RSK block than a Bitcoin block. Anyone know how long it takes between Bitcoin blocks? Uh, 10 minutes, thank you. So if you go 20 times faster, well, that means the RSK blockchain is moving about a block every 30 seconds. Okay. Um, so the way this works is we partner with mining companies. Poolin is one that has been helping us for three, four years now. Because if you don't have the big Bitcoin mining pools merge mining, then you don't have any security. You want to have at least 50, 60% of Bitcoin's hash power contributing to your network. Okay? And the way you can verify that is you pick any new block. Look at the Coinbase. So this one is from, I think, two days ago. Uh, this Coinbase transaction has the requisite number of zeros, so it was mined for Bitcoin, and it has five outputs. The first output is just the miner taking their reward, 6.25 Bitcoins plus all the fees that come with it. And then the next four outputs in the Coinbase transaction, which only a miner can do, only miners can put arbitrary data on the blockchain in the Coinbase transaction. I can put arbitrary data on regular transactions, but not the Coinbase. Right? So we want this to be in the Coinbase transaction. There's four op returns, and the fourth one is what I've highlighted here. So you can check that from any Bitcoin Explorer on, you can just repeat the same process. And if you copy that string, that arbitrary piece of data, and you convert the hex into ASCII, you get something like RSK block and more binary data. This ties the RSK blockchain to the Bitcoin blockchain because we're putting our headers, hashes, directly in Bitcoin. And so that's why we can derive some security from Bitcoin. And then there's more stuff on the RSK blockchain side to decode the rest of the binary stuff, which we'll just skip because we are short in time. Okay. Quickly move on to the second difficult bit, which is how do you get your coin, which we are calling RBTC, to have the same peg value as Bitcoin on the real Bitcoin network. And the way this works is there are two transactions you can do. 
peg money into RSK? What does that mean? You can't actually move Bitcoin off Bitcoin. What you can do is you can lock some of your Bitcoins to a multi-sig address that's controlled by RSK. Right? And then the RSK network will release an equivalent amount of RBTC on the RSK. That's how bridges work. Like Solana and Ethereum bridge, or any kind of arbitrary bridge that you think of, is really locking funds on one side, unlock equal value on the other side. Okay? But taking money from people is easy. Okay, you can give me Bitcoin, I'll, I'll happily take it. What you're concerned about is how do you get it back at the same rate, one to one ratio. Right? So this first picture, which is the peg in, is easy. Our user locks some BTC, it goes to a federation, they control a multi-sig address. A multi-sig address is just like a, a joint account in which a certain number of people have to sign for the money to be useful. The RSK multi-sig requires seven signatures out of 13. At least seven must sign. Uh, but that signature is not needed to receive money, it's needed to spend money. So the receiving part is easy. Uh, users log some Bitcoin, it goes to the multisig, and then there's a smart contract in RSK that releases the equivalent amount of RBTC to the user's address. Okay? What I've highlighted there is the time it takes, 100 confirmations. Our friend earlier said the time between Bitcoin blocks is 10 minutes. How much time is 100 Bitcoin blocks? 16 hours. Okay, think about the user experience. You've just given someone Bitcoin, and before they give you the equivalent amount of RSK, not they, us. We make you wait 16 hours. And when you want to take money out of RSK and back to Bitcoin, well, that's the peg out process. This is where things get tricky. Because now the user will say, I want to take my money out, back to Bitcoin, contract the bridge contract, tell them your intention. The bridge contract has access to a Bitcoin blockchain. Not the entire chain, not this entire thing, but the past 1,000 blocks. So what it does is once your request comes in, it waits for 200 blocks, about 33 hours, still terrible, and then you get your money back. Okay. So what I was gonna talk about today was a way to bypass this whole thing in a decentralized way, in which you can have a third party liquidity provider come in, they take the risk of your Bitcoins being deposited, so you don't have to wait 16 hours, you can just wait the usual six confirmations, and then you get someone to extend you the money on the RSK side faster. So you can work with smart contracts. And what we ended up designing was, if you design something just to receive Bitcoin, it's just easier to design something a little more rich. So you not just receive the Bitcoin on the RSK side, you can actually make a smart contract call on RSK from a Bitcoin transaction. Right? And so, what I'm going to do is just show you a schematic and skip all the security details I was going to talk about. Um, so this is what it would be if we just bring in a, someone as an intermediary, but that's the same as just buying RBTC on an exchange. Right? What we want to do was make it decentralized, and so that's something called a flyover protocol. Um, Okay, for a second I thought even this has a timeout, but no. So what we'll end up with is just this idea that there is a third party that takes a risk. Users lock Bitcoin to a Bitcoin address, and they get RBTC immediately from someone taking the risk. Of course, they take some fees for their service. Okay. The interesting part of this, and this is probably the last thing I'm gonna say, is the Bitcoin address that you deposit to depends on the smart contract call you want to make on the RSK side. So there's a template for the call you want to make, a smart contract call directly from Bitcoin. You hash that template, and you put the hash when you're generating the multi-sig address for the deposit. So each person that wants to make a smart contract call from Bitcoin gets a different Bitcoin address. It's almost like the smart contract itself has a Bitcoin address, although it's on a different chain. Okay. And so that was supposed to be the talk today. I was gonna go with the details of flyover, but we are out of time and I don't wanna go over time. So I'll just stop here. Thank you very much for staying.